Hey there, subscribe to my channel, and also press this bell icon so you never miss any new updates cause whenever we upload new video you will get a notification on your phone. The test is in 4 part, part 1, part 2, part 3, and part 4. Now look at part 1. Part 1 A newly arrived student wants to insure the contents of his apartment. He calls an insurance agent to ask for information. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully to the conversation and answer questions 1 to 6. Good morning, Diane Davis. Can I help you? Yes. I'd like to get some insurance for the contents of my home. Fine. Uh, when did you move into the house? A couple of weeks ago. And, um, it's an apartment, actually. I was told by the landlord that it would be a good idea to get some insurance for the furniture and uh, other personal possessions. Fine. Well, uh, let's get some details. What kind of apartment is it? It's a two-bedroom apartment. Huh? Uh, what floor is it on? Um, why do you need to know that? <laughs> because it affects the cost of the insurance. An apartment on the ground floor isn't as protected as others, and there's more chance of a break-in. Really? I didn't know that. Um, it's on the third... no, uh, second floor. Oh, second. And uh, how much is the rent? It's $615 per month. Good. And uh, where is it located? In Biggin Street, South Hills. I see. And what things did you want to insure? Well, what do you recommend? Well, the most important things are those which you would normally find in a home. Things like the television, fridge and so on. I see. Well, I've got a fridge and a stereo system which I've just bought from a friend. And uh, how much did you pay for the fridge? Uh, $450. Uh, sorry, uh, 50 or 15? 50. And the stereo system cost $1,150. Uh, have you got a television? Yes, but it's very old and not worth much. OK. Uh, well, is there anything else you want to insure? Yes. I've got a couple of watches and my CDs and books. How much do you think they're worth? The watches are worth a thousand dollars. For both of them? No, each one. And altogether, the CDs and books cost me about four hundred dollars. Okay. So the value of everything you want to insure is uh, four thousand dollars. Hmm. How much will the insurance cost? Let me see. Uh, four thousand dollars divided by. Plus 10%. Um, right. So, this kind of insurance, uh, that's private contents insurance, um, it comes to uh, yeah, $184 for a 12-month period. $184? Well, that sounds pretty good. OK, I'll take that policy. Before the conversation continues, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen carefully and answer questions 7 to 10. Can I arrange the policy over the phone? Sure. Just let me get the details down. 
So, that's Mr.、Uh... Gavin Murray. That's M U W R A Y. And the address is. It's sixteen C. Biggins Street, South Hills. Okay, sixteen C, Biggins Street, South Hills. That's right. It's two words: South Hills. And your date of birth is twelfth of November, nineteen eighty. And your contact number. Home phone number is nine eight seven two four eight double five. Right, and、uh, you're Australian? No, I was born in London, although my mother is from Tasmania.、Oh, really? Whereabouts? Hobart. I see. Interesting place. <laughs> Now, are you working at the moment? No. I'm a full-time student at Sydney University. Right.、Uh, good. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear an introductory speech to students at a summer school. You have thirty seconds to look at questions eleven to fourteen. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Climb Summer School. Now, I know most of you have travelled a long way to get here, and you're probably looking forward to settling into your rooms. So I promise I won't keep you long. But we've got to get through this very brief induction just to make your stay here as pleasurable as possible. Now, as you can see, while we're located very close to the centre of London, we're actually quite cut off from the main road. And we've got plenty of space for our facilities and students. This was part of our founder's vision, Jasmine Climb, who thought that the best environment for teenage students would be a place that combines the comforts of a big cosmopolitan city with the beauty and serenity of a quiet, remote site. Now, back in 1983, when our school was founded, this all here was an abandoned warehouse. And the classes were held in the main building that you can see over there. There were no trees, no conifers surrounding the property. There wasn't even a main gate. It took years and a great deal of effort to get our school to where it is today. And I'm sure that if you take a look at page thirty-four in your brochures, where you can find a picture of what the school used to look like back then, you'll agree that the changes we've made are more than impressive. But it's not just the facilities that make Climb Summer School special, obviously, and I'm certain you already know this. Over the following ten weeks, you'll receive an assortment of classes on a variety of topics, ranging from language, literature, and poetry to creative writing, communication, and project management. All of these modules have been designed to improve your chances of getting a place in the universities of your choice. 
while also giving you the opportunity to learn, excel, and of course, also socialize with people from all over the world. I can tell you, just among the 30 of you, we've got about 21 different nationalities. So what happens now? First of all, I'll be handing out a map of the premises for you to have a look at and explaining where everything is. Once we're done here, you'll all be taken to your rooms where you can unpack and relax for a couple of hours. And later on, we'll be having our first activity of the day, a mix and match lunch in the main hall, where you'll have the chance to meet your new classmates. Later on in the afternoon, we'll be handing out your first project assignments and splitting you into teams. And tonight, we'll be having our very first film night, starting with an early 20th century special. You now have 30 seconds to look at questions 15 to 20. So, let's get on with the map. You've already got a version of it in your brochures, so if you can open them to the last page so we can have a look. Very well. As I showed you before, the actual school is right over there in the middle. That's where you'll be having most of your classes. Adjacent to it, you'll find the main hall, which is where we'll be hosting most events, such as today's lunch. On the left from the main building, you'll find a smaller building, which is where the accommodation and welfare offices are located. This is labelled as the garden office at the front, and it's easy to spot because it has a green door. Each of you is assigned to a different residence hall. We've got three residence halls in total, one on the left and two on the right. The one right next to the garden office is Ursula Hall, named after our founder's sister, while the other two are Peter Hall and William Hall. Now, as you can see, there are three more buildings to the left of the semicircle here, and one more building on the right-hand side, next to William Hall. So that one, which is shaped a bit like a dome, is the pavilion. This is where all your letters will be delivered, and in the basement floor you'll also find a laundrette. Please make sure you've got plenty of one-pound coins, as you'll need one for the washing machine and another for the dryer. And that row of buildings on the left... The one closest to us here at the gate is the canteen, where you'll be able to buy snacks as well as breakfast, lunch and dinner on days when we don't have an event with food provided. The next one is the gym, which is open from 7am to 8pm from Monday to Friday and until 10pm at the weekend. And the last building, right over there, is the study centre, where you'll find plenty of computers and books as well as a great selection of DVDs and magazines that you can borrow with only a small refundable deposit of £5. Now, please remember to keep your student card with you at all times as you'll need it to access most of these facilities. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. That essay we have to write, the one on how children learn through the media, how are you planning to write it? Well, I've given it some thought, and I think that the best way to approach it is to divide the essay into two parts. First of all, we'd have to look at some examples of each type of media. Yes, what they are. Then we could describe how we can use each medium so that children can learn something from each one. Exactly. Maybe we could draw up a table and look at examples of each medium in turn. Mm. Uh, let's see, um, the different forms of media would be the print media. Here you'd have things like books and newspapers, that sort of thing. Mm. And included in these are the pictorial forms of print media, like maps. Yes, maps are really just formal pictures, aren't they? Mm. And then there are what we call the audio forms of media where children can listen. Mm -hmm. CDs and radios are probably the best examples because a lot of children have access to these, especially radios. And this would lead into the audio-visual media, mm. which can be seen as well as heard. Uh, film, television, uh, and we mustn't forget videos. Yes, but there's a final category as well. Computers mm -hmm. that make up the so-called electronic media. In the United Kingdom and Australia, they say that one in three families has a computer now. Yes, I believe it. Well, uh, that's a good list to start with. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. We're really getting somewhere with this essay now. Hmm. So let's move on to when each type of medium could be used. I guess we could start by trying to identify the best situation for each type of media. What do you mean? I'm talking about whether each medium should be used with different size groups. For example, we could look at pictures and ask whether they're more useful for an individual child, a few children together, or a full class. In this case, I'd say pictures are best with individual children because they give them an opportunity to let their imaginations run wild. Yes, I see. Let's take tapes next. Although tapes look ideal for individual children, I feel they're best suited to small group work. Mm. This way, children don't feel isolated because they can get help from their friends. Computers are the same. I think they're better with small numbers of children, and they're hardly ever useful with a whole class. Videos, however, are ideal for use with everyone present in the class, especially when children have individual activity sheets to help them focus their minds on what's in the video. And what about books? What would you recommend for them? Books are ideal for children to use by themselves. Mm. I know they're used with groups in schools, but I wouldn't recommend it. Other pictorial media, like maps, though, are different. I'd always plan group work around those. Mm. Give the children a chance to interact and to share ideas. Mm, I agree. Teachers often just leave maps on the wall for children to look at when they have some free time. But kids really enjoy using them for problem solving. Yes. Different people have different ideas, I suppose. Yeah. And different teachers recommend different tools for different age groups. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. I'd like to introduce you all to Donald Mackenzie, who has recently returned from a 12-month research project in America. 
First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Good afternoon. I'm pleased to see so many of you here today. As I told you all on Monday, the lecture on overpopulation has been postponed until next week, as we have a guest speaker today. I'd like to introduce you all to Donald Mackenzie, who has recently returned from a 12-month research project in America. He is here to share with us some of the results of his studies into the problem of illiteracy. Hello. Now, as sociology students, I have no doubt that you are aware that it is commonly believed that one indicator of a developed country is the level of education of its citizens. Now, most of these nations have free compulsory education for all and strict teacher certification requirements. So it would logically follow that people from countries such as America would be highly educated. Yet this isn't always so. In America alone, 42 million adults cannot read and 50 million can recognize so few printed words they each have the reading ability of a ten-year-old. Frightening statistics indeed. But not as frightening as the trend suggested by current estimates. The number of illiterate adults is increasing by approximately two and a quarter million people each year. And although global statistics have not been compiled, it suggests an extremely disturbing figure. Now, inevitably, this is having an impact on employment. In America, the annual cost in welfare programs and unemployment compensation due to illiteracy stands at six billion US dollars and an additional 237 billion a year in unrealized earnings is forfeited by people who lack basic reading skills. There is also the cost of post-school literacy programs which have been put in place in order to counter this increasing figure. A conservative estimate places the cost of these programs at $10 billion each year and growing steadily. Moving on. I'd like to talk about some of the causes of this increasing illiteracy. Children who are taught to read by first learning the alphabet, then the sounds of each letter, how they blended into syllables, and how those syllables made up words. They were taught that English spelling is logical and systematic, and that to become a fluent reader it was necessary to master the alphabetic code in which English words are written, to the point where the code is used automatically with little conscious thought given to it. And to make myself clear, I mean readers could sound out the letters, spelling them phonetically. Once a child learned this ability, attention could be turned to more advanced content. It seldom, if ever, occurred to teachers to give children word lists to read, or to make beginner-level readers memorize whole words before learning the components of those words, or to memorize whole stories, as today's proponents of the whole language approach recommend. Several recent studies have found that 90% of remedial reading students in developed countries are not able to decode fluently, accurately, and at an automatic level of response. The currently used whole language method was originally conceived and used in the early 1800s to teach the deaf how to read, a method which has long since been discarded by the teachers of the deaf themselves as inadequate 
and outmoded. English is an alphabetic language that, that when written, uses letters to represent speech sounds. When students were taught to read, they consciously identified the speech sounds and learned to recognize the letters used to represent them. They were then trained to apply this information to decode the names of unwritten words, understand their meaning, and comprehend the information presented as a complete thought. The English language contains approximately half a million words. Now, of these words, about 300 compose about three quarters of the words that we use regularly. As I said, in schools where the whole language method is taught, children are constantly memorizing sight words during the first three or four grades of school, but are never taught how to unlock the meaning of the other 499,700 or more words. Whole language learning causes frustration, poor spelling, and hostility towards reading. Very bright children who can't memorize long lists of words and retain their meaning are placed in special education, when all they need is to be taught the 26 letters of the alphabet, the 44 sounds they make, and the 70 common ways to spell those sounds. Some researchers believe dyslexia and the symptoms of attention deficit disorder are actually caused by this reversal of the normal learning sequence. So, why do faulty reading methods continue to be used? Well, in short, it's big business. The sale of instructional reading programs is big business today. Each year, publishing companies compete for the adoption of reading programs and workbooks, which have to be replaced annually. Concentrating on phonics would seriously reduce the cost of education. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.